I'd like to announce my new book, How to Be Happy, St. Thomas's Secret to a Good Life. Although just about every marketing firm, self-help guru, and man on the street has an answer, very few, if any, understand true happiness. It doesn't come from power, pleasure, popularity, or possessions. So what is happiness, and how do we find it? In How to Be Happy, I rely on the help of St. Thomas Aquinas to show what will and won't bring us happiness in this life. My hope is that by making the thought of Aquinas accessible for today, my new book will be a helpful guide to a good life. Check the link in the description of this video to get your copy today. Hello, hello, and welcome to Pints with Aquinas. My name is Matt Frad, and I'm hoping that everything is working well because we don't have a video guy today, so it's just me running everything. Uh, so let me know in the live chat if you can hear us okay. I'm here today with Jerry. Hey there. Jerry, I've had Jerry on the show before, uh, discussing all things therapy, therapist, psychological stuff related. It's That's always, right. It's always good to have you. And uh, let's see, we got, yeah, lots of, lots of people uh, filing in to the live chat. But uh, yeah, why are you in Steubenville? Oh, I'm having a great time in Steubenville. Um, I'm working with uh, a small group of professors psycho in psychology and in philosophy, and we're working on a program for integrating Catholic faith for mental health counselors, which is such a need. Is really, you know, we have great, there's a great therapists out there, and there are many Catholic therapists that don't actually know how to ethically, effectively bring the faith properly into the therapeutic process. So it's kind of a think tank, kind of a pilot program going on this week, and great group of people. Is this your first time to Steubenville? It is, it is. Uh, <laughs> when I was a kid, I grew up in Ottawa. Can I tell this story? Is this, yeah, of is course. This cool? I grew up in Ottawa, and I was really brought into a deeper level of faith with uh, the Curcio movement, with the youth group called Challenge in Ottawa, Ontario. This would have been back in the 80s, so I'm really old. And <laughs> I attended for a while St. Mary's Church in Ottawa, which was a charismatic right. renewal church. Father Bob Bedard was a pastor. He's actually the founder of the Companions of the Cross. Mm -hmm. You actually have had Father Mark on here, I think, uh, recently, yes. who is a companion of the cross. And anyway, it was really influenced. I always wanted to go to the Steubenville retreats and all this. But at the time, oh, my life was in a little disarray as a teenager and various things. So I never made it to Steubenville until now. It's amazing. God works amazing ways. He has a plan is all I have to say. And since you shared, and let me share this with you. I don't know if I've ever shared this with you before, but um, you know, my wife is American, I'm Australian. We lived in Ireland for three years and then we moved to Canada. And the reason we moved to Canada is because I was doing a lot of anti-porn kind of work at the time. And I was thinking that this, this could be something the Lord was calling us to do. Right. So we go to Canada, we're literally living beneath the poverty line in Ottawa, the capital city. It was, it was tough going, but hey, we had love. And um, yeah, so while while I was there and in adoration, I, I remember asking myself the question, like, what's what's the best possibility? Like, what what do you want if you could have anything? And what I came up with <laughs> isn't as cool as what I'm doing now, which is nice. But it was like, okay, I want to go live in Steubenville, Ohio, and and go to school there because I hadn't even had my undergrad at the time, and mm. on the weekends travel and speak. Oh wow! Sounds and that great. was you know. There you go. Now I'm here. Look how it worked out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. So we are going to take questions. We have a lot of questions that have come in today from our patrons. And I really do want to say a massive thanks to our patrons. Um, right now, I'm trying to get myself a Jamie, a Joe Rogan's Jamie, right? And in order to do that, I need to pull, pay someone essentially a full-time wage um, because I need them to kind of come here at the drop of a hat. Um, and if they've already got a full-time job, that's not working. So we're 92% towards our goal over on patreon.com slash mattfrad. So if you can help and you want to help make this happen, that would be great because that way I wouldn't have to run these live streams with my own hands and mouth at once. Patreon.com slash mattfrad. When you do, you get access to all of our courses. I'll send you a beer steins, books, and things like that. So please, please consider that. But what one of the perks is you get to ask questions on the show. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to take a ton of questions, which Jerry has not seen yet. 
I have not. I should have asked, right? <laughs> or maybe it's better I just come in cold. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's cool. I think it's nice when people get to yeah, come in cold, as you say. So we're going to go through those questions just from our patrons. Massive thanks to you if you are a patron. And yeah, we'll go from there. So I have the first question. All right. And I think I asked you this in the last live stream, but what is the difference between a psychologist, psychiatrist, therapist, counselor? Is there another name? I don't know. There might be a few other areas too, like coaching and spiritual directors and all that. Um, great Let, question. Spiritual direction might take us too far afield because we actually, I think some questions have to do with that, but maybe. Yeah, yeah. no, I'll, I'll hit yeah. the main one. A psychiatrist is a medical doctor. So they prescribe meds, right? They have training in um, some areas of psych, you know, psychology, psychiatric care, uh, obviously, um, but they're a lot of focus on, on giving meds. Psychologists require also a doctorate degree mm -hmm. um, to be a licensed psychologist, and they do a lot of assessments and testing, as well as um, uh, so, you know um, psychotherapy. Um, a counselor, and you could put in that category a marriage and family therapist, or a professional counselor, or um, a licensed clinical social worker, typically have a master's degree. And, uh, and they can do various other things as well as psychotherapy and counseling. And there's a little difference. Psychotherapy tends to be focused on treating some kind of diagnosis, diagnosed illness, mm -hmm. mental illness. Counseling tends to be focused on how do I help someone live a better life. Hmm. That's good. Thank you. All right. Well, let's start taking some of these questions here. Uh, first one comes from Wesley Novak suggestions on working on borderline personality disorder particularly the self-hatred from a christian perspective hmm. now, unfortunately you can't ask him to follow up so maybe uh, right like i'd have questions <laughs> like is this for him is he have suggestions borderline? on working on pers borderline personality disorder particularly the self-hatred from a christian perspective okay. feel free to answer it from whatever way yeah because like, i don't know if this person may be living with someone with borderline or they themselves may have borderline I will start by just plugging a book that I think is great. There's a book called Walking on Eggshells. Can't remember the name of the authors, but they have they have the main version. They have one for families. It's a very similar themes in both, but really do help you to process that. In, in case you don't know, a, a borderline is a um, a personality disorder. So it's a, that would be on that end of needing psychotherapy more than just counseling. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and there's sort of a structure of the personality that has sort of a uh, a defect, if you will, that needs to be kind of reworked in pro deep level of processing. Um, I would see borderline as a very um, set of symptoms related to deep attachment wounds. So when we're children, we have deep attachment, obviously, usually with our parents, right? It's initial attachment. Often it's, often it's the mother, but it's usually parents. And that wound is somehow damaged or hurt. Mm -hmm. So, um, so uh, usually, m not all, but in l most cases of borderline, there's usually really deep levels of trauma where at a very early age, the person learned they couldn't trust other people. And so it presents itself as, um, you know, let's see, I've, I'm saying as a clinician, because I've had some borderline clients, it's yeah. not my main thing, but um, they will love you, love you, love you. They will think you are ideal, you are the best. So you'll do one thing and then they'll hate you, hate you, hate you. Okay. So there's this sort of love hate thing like a going switch on. switch that's flipped where they, when they feel threatened. Yes. Yeah. And so if you're, if you have a borderline person in your family, they, you, there might be times when it feels like that person is just wonderful and amazing and super connected, maybe too much, or they're completely distant and they take everything kind of personally and they're just angry at everyone and they detach. So it's a pretty serious, that's actually a really serious diagnosis. Um, and it takes a lot of work. The, the main type of therapy that is usually prescribed is called DBT, dialectical behavior therapy. It's very effective with borderline. Um, you said it's, this is a very serious thing because I imagine most of us could maybe see ourselves in that description. You know, we, we all have wounds and when people mm. kind of tread upon them, we can react negatively. Right. So I suppose you wouldn't want people necessarily to 
diagnose themselves as right and, oh yeah. please don't yeah and that happens all the time like i'll have a, a usually couples right it's often a wife for some reason but we'll come in and say i'm sure my husband has a narcissistic personality disorder i know him and i've read it online and he clearly fits the criteria and the reality is we're all a little narcissistic i mean it's you know there's an aspect of humanity following humanity where we're going to be narcissistic to reach a clinical level where a person will be diagnosed you needs a psychologist or a or a you know or a counselor a trained counselor or whatever to be able to do a proper diagnosis with proper assessment yeah that's really helpful because I, I think that a lot of us seem to be becoming more comfortable with psychological language right like narcissism you know the internet because we just go online and google it you could even look yeah. up the dsm and see the criteria yourself but it's another thing to be trained in it where you are used to seeing it so i can it's hard to say, but sometimes it's in my bones. Like if somebody is borderline, I just feel it really? <laughs> because you see enough of it. So long, yeah, yeah, you see enough of it. It's like autism. Like for a long time, uh, autism or it was called Asperger, sort of the high functioning autism. I would have, I don't know what it is because I worked with a lot of kids with aut uh, Asperger's. Mm -hmm. um, they would come in and they had been diagnosed with ADHD when they were like seven. Then they got diagnosed when they were with OCD when they were like 10 or 11. Then they walk into my office and I spend five minutes with them and I just get the Asperger's vibe. <laughs> and then of course they do an a proper assessment, but yeah. it's like right away I see it. Yeah. It's like you feel it. Interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. But you can't be objective about it when it's your spouse or your kids. Yeah. You just can't be. Yeah. All right, here's another question. This comes from Nigel Valakotith. Thank you for being a patron, Nigel. He says, how to know when you are over-psychologizing your spiritual problems or over-spiritualizing your psychological problems? Great question. That is a fantastic question. Um, yeah, it's. I would say that uh, for a lot of Catholics, and I work with you know, primarily, like I would say 90% Catholics, I say the biggest problem is usually the over-spiritualizing. Mm. So... It's, you know, might be part of a denial of what might be going on on the human level, on the natural level. And so um, I want to, you know, fix the problem spiritually. And as, you know, like your Aquinas, what does he say? You know, uh, grace perfects nature. Grace transforms nature. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the exact translation. It doesn't obliterate it. Right. And so we do have to think about the natural realm. And we do have to work on that level. So... Um, I think, but m many of us might not want to for lots of reasons, right? We don't want to have to face issues such as depression or anxiety, or I would say underneath all that, some deeper levels of trauma. And so we turn to our spiritual faith and well-intentioned, um, but then that becomes uh, the only answer. And, uh, and then it ends up possibly leading to some despair when the old habits return we're really not dealing with the human nature there on the other side the other side of that question uh is there a tendency to psychologize i think that can happen uh i was just oddly enough talking uh or listening to an exorcist uh, or he wasn't an exorcist but he trains exorcists anyway recently and like today and uh it made me think you know do i even know will i be able to identify what would be a demonic presence versus a psychological disorder it's a very difficult thing and of course there's all the questions of oppression versus like full-blown possession and this kind of thing so actually listening to him helped me to kind of get a sense for how rare possession actually is but this the signs would have to be something irregular and natural as you listen to that talk today did yeah. you think to yourself wow i've, I've dealt with some people who we're experiencing some oppression or yeah, um, I, not possession. I really don't feel like I've experienced that. Thank goodness. Um, and, and I and if I did, of course, I would go to refer to the diocese, right, to, for them to send the right person. Uh, but I I do believe that I've seen oppression at play. Mm -hmm. I really do think that's just my world view on it. And in oppression, um, they don't need a, a full blown solemn exorcism. They but they might need spiritual remedies, right. uh, the sacraments, and and so on. I mentioned one thing that's difficult, and I've experienced this as I've spoken to people about overcoming pornography is. As you say, if someone's over-spiritualizing a problem and you're trying to correct that, mm -hmm. it can sometimes be interpreted that oh. you're, you're diminishing 
uh, right. the importance of the spiritual life, which is, isn't what you're doing. So how right. is it that you have these conversations with people in a way that right. you show that you are giving, you know, uh, the spirituality it's due? Yeah. But at the same time, yeah. this Great. Be a natural Thank thing. you. That helps me to pinpoint it too. Um, here's one way I look at it, and I've talked about it before on, on the show, and I know in Souls and Hearts, our, our, our online program, we have we, we describe internal family systems or parts work. And so the, the concept here would be that as a human person, you know, you have a core self created in God's image, and also this, this core self is sort of who we are. But within that, maybe within the soul, I'm not really totally sure, but within the self, we have these parts, mm -hmm. right? And and different aspects or, pers you know, I would say it this way, like there's a part of me that wants to go to the gym right after this and like work out and lose weight and be on top of things. And then there's another part of me that just wants to binge watch Netflix and nobody talk to me and be by myself. All right. I can't let either one of those parts take over and become like a pseudo self, like and take over me, right? I have to have the self, the core self, right? Um, hopefully, you know, in a state of grace, and but able to lead all of my parts. In other words, the part that wants to work out is not a bad part of me, right? It's just maybe it has a burden. It has this belief that uh, I'm not good enough. I don't, you know, my physical body is not good enough. And so I have to like go, go, go with that. And then I have another part of me that is like, says I'm tired and I never get rest, I never get a break, and so I need all the rest I can have, right? Kind of like sending me into a all-you-can-eat buffet, like I've got to eat everything in sight or, you know, because there, there'll be some kind of, you know, whatever <laughs> loss if I don't. So here, here's the, the self has to be what informs, like the self in connection with God and prayer and all that informs discipline, right? And so it's okay for the self really to be the one that says, hey, um, we need to include prayer in our lives. And we might have a part that says, okay, prayer, I, I, I'm so, God is so far away from me and I'm so bad. And there might be a part like that. We all have sort of shamed parts. Oh, so let's do a rosary every day. Let's do a holy hour every day. Let's go to, you know, let's join this. Let's consecrate to this. Let's do all these things, right? And so this part is almost acting out of this anxiety that I have to be super, super holy. And it's so excited that there's some notice, right? And so bang, you start all this stuff. Well, if it's just the part doing that, that level of anxiety, it will collapse collapse right it will collapse if if it's just if that's the motivation in fact that part might need an intervention of some kind or i would say the self being able to go to that part and say you're good you have this good intention to honor god but you know we need to pay attention to all of our parts right because there are parts in the system like i was just mentioning that need to rest there are parts in the system that do need physical exercise you know, that's good to be physically healthy. You know, there are all these other, let's, let's take a balanced approach. So why don't we, would it be all right with this part if you just, you know, we started with daily mass. Let's just try to do daily mass at least, let's say three times a week, hmm. right? And as our system is, and we're going to go to the gym three times a week, right? And we're going to, um, we're going to do something fun on the weekends as a break, mm -hmm. some leisure, right? And maybe as things are going, we add things to it as we're growing and maturing. Yeah. But it's not this anxiety of a burden part that is, you know, in yeah, trouble. Like that. Yeah, that, that, that really is, that's really interesting and helpful. Um, you said that if it's coming from a place of anxiety, if this part is taking over the whole, it will collapse. So my question is, why is that the case? And what does that look like mm. when that, that person who is using that spiritual part, you know, right. what does that look like when that collapses? Well, I think that, we're not really, it's not good for us to allow, if you will, this is the language of parts work, to allow a part that is burdened with something. We say blend, become totally immersed, in, enmeshed with the self, right? Because once that happens, there's a huge burden that is driving. And here we could, I could draw on other types of therapies to say there's this lies or negative cognitions, they might say. The lies sort of take hold. And now all of a sudden the self, in mm. a sense, thinks in, the, in terms of these lies, <clears throat> right? And we, we can't, and then we might, you know, just be living out of that space for a long time. It's just unhealthy. And we're not, when we're, all these parts are blended with the self, 
I don't believe we can properly access God in prayer. We can't properly receive fully those graces that he wants to give us because we're, we're in a state of anxiety or what I'd say overburdened. Yeah. And so once we separate them out, I like that. then we can take care of them. We can use, and when needed, actually access prayer and grace maybe allow god to come with us like obviously invite god advice christ to like be with that part when needed you know maybe the truth hey this part that is over anxious about spirituality just needs to be reminded there's nothing you can do to receive my love you know this uh i'm gonna see this as a free therapy session if you don't mind yeah yeah. (laughs) Uh, this this actually reminds me exactly of a place i was at after having served with net ministries of canada which is a uh, organization where people travel and lead Mm -hmm. retreats i was then placed on a team that was going to ireland and i had a a tremendous conversion when i was 17 years old i mean it was like a world change it was like i began seeing things in color and couldn't relate in the same way to the world and people around me the way that I once did. So it was an authentic, real, liberating experience. But then when I started getting attention for that, Mm. uh, especially from religious types of people, I began to adopt this persona, like I'm the really intensely passionate holy guy. Like that's, Mm. that's who I am. And I enjoyed when people saw that and affirmed that. And when I was about to go to Ireland, I encountered some people who were talking about somebody who was on their team who seemed to be a threat to that mm. because they were really, really spiritual and they would pray for hours at a time and you know, probably from a good place. And I remember feeling really uh, agitated by mm. that. Um, so anyway, I just thought that that, that that was excellent because what I needed to hear in that place was, you can't earn my love. Mm-hmm. I love you as you are, right. too much to leave you that way. Um, and it's almost like as the self begins to accept its God's acceptance of it, these parts, you hold them loosely or you don't hold them with as much intensity. Mm-hmm. It, they become more second nature, does it? Absolutely. Sense, the way I would see it is that the, the, the core self we have, like created in his image, is naturally compassionate, is naturally calm. Is naturally has wisdom naturally and 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 it's just sort of part of being created in his image and so when we tr- when that core self is engaging with our inner parts mm-hmm. our inner world we are experiencing that compassion within ourselves and that is about to me that's about healing because then there's also parts that are maybe further away and out of reach. We call those exiles. There are parts that are um, wounded in some way, you know, experiencing a lot of trauma. And, and we're able to reach those parts for healing. But let's say the system is, is, is in, in good order, right? And we're, we're treating our inner selves properly. Now we are able to engage that self is not enmeshed with any dysregulated parts. Mm -hmm. And it is able to then reach out to um, other people. Maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's other people with compassion, Mm -hmm. calm demeanor, um, you know, uh, 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 be creative, be alive, be in the zone. And we're not dysregulated by their dysregulation. Interesting. Or less likely to. Yeah. I mean, parts will sometimes in within us kind of speak up or take over and we have to pause and kind of like say, okay, I, I hear you, you know, and we're, it's a gentleness with our own system though, but, but a firmness. Somebody said something to me recently and I, I wonder if this is going along with what you're saying. I was saying, I just feel like, and I said something rather negative, you know, like I, I, I want to whatever. Right. And he said to me, you know, something I've found helpful is if I say part of me Yes. wants to do this part of me wants to do that because he said really th- there's a deeper part of you that doesn't want that bad thing right so sp- speak to that a bit i love that you said that i that's the, exactly the kind of language we want people to start using because it's never that the whole like when it's a when you have an agenda or you're acting out of an insecurity you're never that's never all of you it's not the whole self it's just it is like you said a part but like you said so well just now there's another part that reacts against it which is an inner conflict right just like my one part wants to go to the gym one part wants to watch netflix like that's it creates an inner conflict one part of me 
you know, like hates that person because they said that. And another part of me is like, uh, why are you so mean to everybody? Why are you such a rude person? Right. And they're in inner conflict with each other. And if you slow it down and actually approach those parts, none of them are bad in and of themselves. They might be dysregulated in some way. You discover that they are burdened with something, right? So what, what's wrong with the person who hates somebody else? It's usually self-hatred. So when you get under that a little bit, you find out, ah, okay, I'm projecting my own self-esteem issues on that person. And the other side, right, they're, maybe they're being kind of judgy, <laughs> right? And they're, there's sort of a need to look right and do the right thing for others to see, right? And so, hey, both of them need something different. But when they do receive that compassion, care, but a deeper understanding and insight and unburdening, whoa, they calm down. And then we find out how useful those parts actually are. That's interesting. Because even the one that sounded so critical is maybe a good part that is helpful in discernment, choosing right from wrong, making good choices. But when overburdened with fear and insecurity, am I good enough or whatever? suddenly just looks out of control and just seems judgmental and hateful. Yeah, these, these are really great answers. I'm tempted to keep talking, but we've got a lot of questions. Yeah. Here. Uh, there's a great answer. That was really helpful. Thanks, uh, Jerry. Okay, this question comes from Dan Capes. Thanks for being a patron, Dan. What is the distinction between psychology and spirituality? Wow. Okay. Well, we touched on it a moment ago, but what a great question. And I'm here because we're doing a workshop here at SIT Franciscan on that exact topic is how do you integrate spirituality and psychology? So the way I might look at it is as a mental health professional, because I, I tend to say that now, I, I, rather than explain all my credentials or whatever, I'm just a mental health professional, right? The reality is the way I see it, I have to be part psychologist, which is the study of the mind. I have to be part theologian, which is the study right of God. I have to be part physiologist, which is the study of the human body. I have to be part neuroscientist, because it's the study of the actual, how the brain works, especially when you're working with trauma, you do need to understand how different parts of the brain work. So that's a, and, and on some level, um, people are coming, they're not just um, bodies without souls, right? Thomas Aquinas, right? The, uh, what is it? The uh, soul is the form of the body, right? Mm -hmm. So their bodies and souls are connected. How could I treat the brain, the mind, the physical body, and not consider the soul? It is, it is, it is, mm. the body is a form of, the, the soul is the form of the body. Right. So we're, we're body, soul, we have to know we about can't. spirituality. So spirituality is, it's a big one to define, but it's the way we connect, I would say, and there's other good definitions, the way we connect with the transcendent. So I would say God, the way we connect, the, not just knowing about God or talking about what we think we know about God, but actually connecting with God, connecting with the transcendent and finding meaning in life, right? So that to me is what is spirituality. So shouldn't that go with the psychological sciences? Shouldn't those be married? They're distinct, mm. but married. I like that, yeah. Or you're missing a huge yeah, part of the human they're person. They're distinct and married just like the body and soul are distinct and married. Mm -hmm. I mean, there will be a time when we die uh, that will be, unless it's the second coming, we'll be separated from our bodies. So th right. there is a separation there, but we aren't, we aren't souls in a machine. We're body-soul composites. And so to be interested in the soul is to be interested in the body and, and vice versa, which is, yeah. again, one of the reasons in Aquinas talks about the, the virtue of play. Right. Um, you know. Oh, well, I could talk about that. But you know, it's a really Renaissance thing, right? Like they didn't make, they didn't separate those things as much, in the, right? In the Renaissance, right? Or even Aquinas' time, like mm -hmm. those things were just automatically considered connected. Right, right. Right, we've made all these kind silos. Kind of split, right? Yeah. 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 Okay, another question here comes from Catherine Milner. When is it appropriate to seek the expertise of a therapist? This is a great follow-up. When is it appropriate to seek the expertise of a therapist rather than, or in addition to, a spiritual director? Yeah, yeah. And a good spiritual director will actually know when to refer, just like a good therapist would know when to refer to a spiritual director. Mm. So, um, okay, so I would say there's two types of activities that say I do, right? I'm actually licensed as a marriage and family therapist and a professional counselor, that, those are my identities. And so 
I do both psychotherapy and counseling. And there's an overlap, but there's a distinction. So clearly, if there's a mental illness present, then that's outside the realm of spiritual direction, right? So you can't, in spiritual direction, you can't deal with, you know, um, panic disorders or chronic depression and things like that. So if there's a mental illness, definitely you need to refer. If, but there's other issues that counselors are especially good at working at, which might be um, working on marriages, when there's a disconnection in a marriage in terms of the way they're connecting with each other. Um, certainly if there's questions like, you know, relating to other people like bullying issues or like, you know, maybe there's a family dynamic issues, uh, career issues. There's all kinds of ways in which a counselor might be able to help someone to just, you know, live a good life. Mm-hmm. Okay. Very good. Sorry, I thought that was. More I could there. throw in another <laughs> plug, just because I've hired a coach recently. Please, um, is that Catholic coaching is a really interesting op- option as well, which doesn't go to the level. It's not therapy where they're working on past traumas or anything like that, but it's a very solution focused approach to working on problems. So some couples might actually benefit from a marriage and family mm. therapist or from a couples coach. Okay. Just, Tell us about your podcast too. You mentioned Souls and Hearts a moment ago. People might want to check that out. Yeah, yeah. Well, Souls and Hearts is an online mental health resource that Dr. Peter Mal- Malinowski, who's a licensed psychologist in Indiana, and I developed. And we have on their blogs and communities. I'm actually just starting a new community July 1st called Catholic Journeymen. And it's just a community for men who are wanting to improve both their spiritual life, but also issues with addiction, trauma, depression, you know, relationship improvement. So it's meant to be a small community of men. So I have that going on as a community and I have a podcast called Be With The Word still going on. I reflect on the Sunday readings from a psychological perspective. Be With The Word, okay. Be With The Word, yes. (laughs) Cool, thanks, all right, people should check that out. All right, got another question here from Dan Kinsley. Do you have any experience with clients with depression, anxiety, who wrestle with scrupulosity? If so, what advice do you offer them or what resources do you direct them toward? Thank you and God bless. Yeah, I do see that a lot. I actually did a Be With The Word episode on scrupulosity. By the way, you could look it up. (laughs) Uh, It's on YouTube, Spotify, and and, uh, Apple and all that. But... um, to just answer your question quickly, um, yeah, there, there are a number of resources for scrupulosity. And what I typically see is a religious form of scrupulosity, right? And so, uh, which is kind of a form of OCD. Yeah. So there's an obsessive compulsive nature to it. And so um, w- there's a couple of different approaches. So one, the traditional approach is that kind of extinction kind of approach where you would have the person experience a negative effect in small ways, a little bit, and you grow over time, you experience it more and more and more. So um, that's one way. Another way I like to approach it is to um, do different interventions, like some parts work stuff, to figure out what is it in that, there's a part of that person that feels completely overwhelmed. Usually it's the idea that God is not safe, the Mm -hmm. world is not safe, I have to do things to um, stay safe. And I see a lot of people have experienced like, who have this issue, have, have experienced like a loss, like even a loss of a grandparent or, or a parent or somebody early in life, and they just don't feel safe, and they sort of as a child take on that responsibility. Mm-hmm. And so now they're overly worried about every action that they take is a mortal sin. So these are people often going into confession like constantly, like every other day going to confession, and the priest is like, stop going to confession, and this kind of thing. And it, when it's sexual, then it's like, takes on the form of, oh, I looked at a woman, I saw, I, I thought she was, thought a certain thing, now all of a sudden I'm in mortal sin, right? Because mm-hmm. Jesus said, you know, if as you look at a woman, you lust after her, she's, you've committed adultery. And so they take every law to the extreme and apply it to themselves, even when there's, you know, and they, they, they won't accept anything else. That, that's a, if that's what's going on, that's a really tough one, but it means there is a part of them mm-hmm that hasn't, and for some reason, cannot accept the fact that you are saved by grace alone, through faith, but by grace alone. In other words, like Augustine would say, it's all, it grace. You know, there's something Pelagianist mm-hmm. about this because you're thinking I have to do something 
or else God is going to forsake me. So there's a, it's a really difficult challenge, right? But to really get to that part, because that part of the person sincerely believes that if they don't be, if they're not scrupulous, they're going to hell. Mm, yeah. 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 I've said in the past, I think scrupulosity is more of a it's not a cross the Lord's calling us to carry. It's almost like a scourge of the enemy that we're called to renounce in the name of Jesus. Yeah. And two things that really helped me with scrupulosity, which I share for those watching. One is a book called I Believe in Love. I did a video the other day. I gave away 100 copies. That's how passionate I am about it. Great. It's a, it's a book based. It's, a, it's a basically a retreat in a book format based on the teachings of Tres Religieux. But also, honestly, it was the sixth session at the Council of Trent on justification. Mm-hmm. I realized that, that, you know, what the church did and did not teach about our yeah. certainty of, of salvation and what kind of certainty we could have. And that, You know, it's hitting me too, just to add, is that for anybody that I've worked with with OCD or scrupulosity, there's usually an inability to sit with negative emotions. Hmm. In other words, and any negative emotion is overwhelming to that person. So I know like I do EMDR, which is a type of trauma treatment, which I love. But it's very tricky. I can't do it immediately with someone with OCD because what EMDR as a treatment will do will activate the system. Not You don't want to do too much, but enough that the system is activating, you start to feel some strong emotion. Well, if you have scrupulosity, that is overwhelming because you, you can't handle that. And then the person will, will check out of that experience in some way or another. And so you have to start by teaching them that negative emotions are a normal part of life and strategies to learn to sit with them, whether it's shame, sadness, guilt, whatever the negative, you know, hurt feelings, whatever it is, we all have to sit with them. Most of us don't want to sit with them. Yeah, which is why we're always (laughs) on the go. Mm. All right, that's interesting. Thank you. All right, we got another question here from patron Michael Lay or Lays. Thank you. What are some common themes you see in people who have experienced healing? What does a healed person oh, or a healing person I like, like that question because it's positive. <laughs> <laughs> I usually get everything negative. Like people don't often come into my office and go, I am healed. Let's sit down and talk. But uh, no, but I, I, I do sometimes have that and then they're done. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but here's the thing. Healing to me means a few things. And it, one of them I would say is that you're in, you're living in a kind of a good zone. So you find meaning and purpose in what you're doing. So even if the actions can sometimes be tedious or slow or, or whatever, you're doing it out of a sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. And it's not like, oh, I have deadlines and I'm stressed and I'm, you know, and it's like, oh, I have to get this done and do the next thing. It's none of that. It's this. I'm, I'm feeling fully alive in the work I do because it has meaning for me. That's one. Another one, and that might not be number one, that might be number two or three, I'm not sure. But probably number one is, I feel connected in a, and present with God and with the people that matter to me in my life. Whoa, because when you feel connected and, pre- and then present is really important, then you're being. You know, you're actually a human being, not a human doer, and you are actually um, alive. And it, and to, to Therese of Lisieux's, Lisieux's point, or Catherine Doherty, another one I really love, and, and, and our brother Lawrence, it's like you could be changing a diaper and feel that. Mm. You could be wiping a toilet and you could feel that presence and that connection with God even in those moments. And so everything you do is transformed. I, I don't know what you think about this, uh, but for me, the one of the litmus tests for myself that I know that I'm in a good place is that um, I'm meek with people, you know, mm. like uh, they don't irritate me as much and I don't get offended easily. Right. It's just a, it's like almost like a drooping of the shoulders, not a drooping, but a sort of relaxation in the body yeah. around people. And I just, I know I, I'm not hyper in my head. I'm not super aware of what you think of me right now. Right. I can get to that, but if I'm in a good place, that's much, much less. I don't know. That really is like speaking from the core self, like we were talking about before, like being in the self, as you would yeah, say. Yeah. And and so you're not threatened by all these most of us have insecurities, right? We're either anxious, you know, or we're avoidant, or we're in some way acting in an insecure manner. But when we feel safe, then it means that we um, we can be vulnerable. Can be who are we are. We're not grasping. 
we are yeah. we're detached. I like to use holy indifference. I get from St. Ignatius and St. Francis de Sales. And it's like this concept of just, it's kind of the opposite of codependence. It's just like, uh, I'm detached. I, I can detach with love, right? I'm not indifferent as if I don't care. It's more that I'm not bound up in these things of the world the mm -hmm. same way. Mm -hmm. so. All right, well, I want to get to the next question. Before I do, I want to remind people that this or well, tomorrow we have a debate uh, between a Catholic and a Protestant on the magisterium. It's going to be excellent. In fact, we have Suan, who's the Catholic debater. He's teaching a seven-part video series, kind of a masterclass on the papacy right now over at patreon.com slash mattfrad. And we are trying to raise more money right now because I'm trying to bring someone on full-time uh, here in Steubenville who can run the cameras, do the video editing, and do a lot of other things that I need done. So we're 92% uh, way to our goal right now. So if you would like to support the work that we're doing, you give us five bucks a month or 10, and you get different things in uh, as a thank you, go over to patreon.com slash mattfrad and um, you can learn more about that. And speaking of patrons, we're taking patron questions only today. And uh, we have another question here comes from Lindsay Clark. Can hypnosis used for relaxation be an entry point for demons? I've been using this for years, but I recently heard someone say it could be. So I'm obviously concerned. All right. Well, that's a great question. Um, I've had only a little training in hypnotherapy, um, but I've actually been doing a lot of training in ego state therapy, which, a type, which is a type of parts work which actually comes from the hypnotherapy tradition. So the way I would see this is we all have a window of tolerance that we live in in life. And by that, I mean, um, I, if, if you picture a window and I'm living my life within that window. So if I go to the top of the window, I'm getting more, a little more anxious. Mm -hmm. And if I cross the threshold to, over the top, I am suddenly, um, I'm overwhelmed. I'm like panicking, fight or flight. If I go down all the way to the bottom, I'm in a very calm state. Right. Now, if, and that might be meditation or whatnot. If I go below that, I start to dissociate. So now I'm no longer really present with my own body, this kind of mm. thing. The way that I see hypnotherapy, I'm not gonna speak of all hypnosis out there because I'm not a hypnotist. I don't know what the magical illusionists do and all that, and <laughs> sure. I wouldn't be interested in any of that. But what I do know in terms of hypnosis is that they typically go down below. They don't go to the point of dissociating completely so the person is still present. If you completely dissociated, you're not aware almost of your body. But you kind of go to a place but a little bit above that. So you are in a, in a slightly altered state. And so there is a certain vulnerability if you're working with somebody who's working with you at that, in, that, in that place. So if you feel safe with the person, it should be fine. But, um, but that would be the same of any therapist. A therapist could you know, introduce a negative thought or something to you if they're unethical. So, um, so I would say hypnotherapy is actually a really interesting and well-researched area. I don't see it as a risk of demons. I think that if you're doing hypnosis by yourself, I would worry about that. Hmm. We have a question here from Sergio Phelan. Why should one go to a therapist who happens to be Catholic versus any other therapist? What, what, what is the benefit? Right, right. So here's a couple things, all right? The, that would be a question to ask a therapist, like if you are a particular therapist. So if you're thinking of a therapist and you are Catholic and you're, you want to know, should I go to the Catholic one? Say there's only three in town and one's Catholic. I would ask him that or her that question and see how they answer it because there's different ways and there's of doing Catholic therapy and you want to make sure you're comfortable with it. So here's a basic level one. I used to get this all the time when I was, uh, you know, I was working as a pretty obviously Catholic therapist or practice, but I would have people call and say, "Are you Catholic?" Because I was at Catholic Charities or somewhere, and the therapist I thought would have been Catholic and they weren't. Why do they care? Well, on a very basic level, uh, if, you're a ca if you're truly a Catholic therapist, you are not going to ever promote a divorce. 
you might need to promote a separation for someone's safety or something like that. And if they do divorce, that's their choice. If they get an annulment, that's all in their their business. But I'm never going to be the one that says, go get a divorce. Never going to be the one that says, go get an abortion. I'm never going to be the one that says, yeah, it's okay to do hormone replacement you know, or anything like that. I'm never going to argue with the magisterium of the church and my clients know that they cannot, they're not going to come to me and I'm never going to argue with them about their faith or make them have to defend it. And sometimes they get that in other therapists, right? Because the other, maybe it's, it's, it's actually a, a negative thing on purpose, or maybe it's not, but sometimes other therapists are like, why we'll, we'll see their Catholic faith as something pathological. That isn't going to typically happen with a Catholic therapist. But, okay, so that's number one, just safety. And then another aspect might be that, um, is that therapist doing any Catholic interventions of any kind? So, for example, when I do EMDR work, as long as it's what the client wants, and I'm drawing it from the client's resources, but still, we might use a spiritual resource. We might invite Our Lady to help with something. I've had this happen when I work with somebody with a traumatic pregnancy, and Our Lady of Guadalupe came into, hmm. like, actually came into the processing, not because I asked, it's the client, came from the client, to help deliver the baby hmm. and to restore the memory, hmm. right, and bring healing. And so things like that can happen, I think, in Catholic. Now, maybe not all Catholic therapists would do that, though, right? You might need training. You might need, that might be your specialization. Uh, but you might want to know. You, that, that would be to ask them wh- what your comfort level is. Okay, but to push back on that a little bit, suppose yeah. somebody's dealing with what they would consider to be a sex addiction or a pornography addiction. Right. Wouldn't that person be better to find a certified sex addiction therapist, contact them and say, I just want to make sure you understand that my understanding of sobriety involves no mm. sex outside of marriage, no sex with self, no contracepted sex. Right. Um, wouldn't would that be a better thing to do than just to find some Catholic therapist and who has no experience with sex addiction that's, that's at all? That's what I'm asking. Yeah. Yeah. No. As long as yeah, absolutely. So I don't. I'm not certainly not advocating all therapists are bad unless they're Catholic right. and should avoid them at all costs. No. There are amazing therapists out there um, doing amazing work that are not working from any religious perspective at all, and that's okay. And sometimes that's better. Um, I agree. So if it was if you had a sex addiction and there was only three therapists and the one was a CSAT who was positively disposed to your faith or at least was respectful, then I would go with that over the Catholic therapist who asks, what's a sex addiction? Fair enough. <laughs> Fair <laughs> right? enough. But um, where would somebody go if they wanted to find a Catholic therapist in the area? Yeah, yeah. So um, catholictherapist.com is a great resource. Um, the Catholic Psychotherapy Association has a member directory that you can see online. And so you can see who's a member of that organization. Um, we actually have a free course on soulsandhearts.com mm-hmm. on how a Catholic's guide to finding a therapist, which probably gives you more than you would ever want to know about how to make those selections. Okay, soulsandhearts.com. <laughs> yes. That's great. All right, got another question here from Ryan Nash. He says, as a therapist myself, I am constantly wrestling with this question. How do you navigate working with individuals who have lifestyles incompatible with Catholic moral teaching? LGBT, affirming ideologies, pro-choice, divorce, etc. Yeah, okay, yeah, what a great question. So that one's rich. <laughs> um, here's, here's different thoughts, right? Um, I am pretty explicit. I don't think it's overdone, but my, my practice is called transfiguration counseling. And so, um, you know, most people are going to know I'm a, I'm a Catholic therapist. And so most people are choosing me or the people that the, the therapists that work with me for that reason. So, but if somebody came in, you know, and said, hey, I want marriage counseling or I want this kind of counseling and I'm not a Catholic and I, you know, whatever, I, I'm trans or gay or whatever the issue is, I would just simply treat that person with love. And, and if I'm qualified to work on the issues they're presenting, then I will do what I can. So if they're coming in with depression, I can treat depression. Uh, I, it, it's, it is harder be, in some ways because I have to be very conscious of the fact that it's not my job to impose my faith on them. Um, but I think I'm competent enough to do that work. What I would say would be that I believe that as a Catholic therapist, um, if I can't say a word about faith, 
at all. Maybe I'm working in a completely secular environment, you know, an agency, then you would be fired for that. I still believe that I can embody Christ in a sacramental level in my own disposition. And I feel like even if the, the other person should experience from that, love, compassion. But, but isn't, kind of isn't part of being compassionate with somebody who's a man who thinks they're a woman trying to help them help their beliefs line up with reality? Right. But they have the trick here is a question of free will still, because if they're coming in for treatment, uh, if they're actually coming in for, for me to help them, you know, like come out or something or like to, that is a trickier situation that I would have to say, this isn't my area of expertise. But if they're coming in to say, Hey, I want to work on my anxiety issues. Well, I'm an expert in anxiety. I can help you with that. Right. Sure. Um, it's now here's the thing that I find interesting. Um, because I do EMDR, it's a type of treatment where you locate, you notice targets from the past that are affecting you in the present, right? Maybe it's post-traumatic stress disorder or something like that. So, so when one goes back to a time in the past, let's say the person is, I don't know, let's say they identify as trans. Well, it's not my job to say you shouldn't be trans or what's wrong with you or something like that. But it's my job to say, okay, what, you know, what happened to you? in your life? Do you want to work on those traumas and bring healing? So in part of the process, for example, um, I can re recall an incident with someone where they were young and they saw themselves in the bathtub and they said, this part, this, this physical part of me doesn't belong here. Yeah. Right? So, whoa. So at that early age, you looked at yourself and thought, Hey, I'm not really mm. a boy or something. And, but in part of the process in EMDR would be to say in that process, what do you wish was true? What, what, what do you wish was true? And then the answer I got in one case was um, that I could accept myself. Mm. So I'm not the one imposing that. I'm just following the protocol. Now, maybe a different person wouldn't say that, but then I let that unfold, that maybe it's not me imposing, oh, I don't believe in this. It's just me loving that person and walking them through the process of healing of a trauma. Let me push back again just to kind of get yeah, some yeah. clarity. If I was a client, is that the word, of yours? Or mm -hmm. a, if I was a client yeah. of yours and I was committing adultery, I presume right. you would try to show me lovingly and in a non-judgmental way that I shouldn't be doing that and that this might be the cause of some of my anxiety and right. the fact that my life's falling apart. Right. So if you're willing to do that about adultery, surely you should be willing to do that when it comes to somebody engaging in same-sex behavior. Well, so here is another thing, right? Um, if somebody is a committing adultery, um, then th I have a couple of, I would have a bunch of questions. Am I also seeing the wife? Is this marriage counseling? Because there I wouldn't be able to keep that secret. I might not be able to divulge, hey, this is the reason. Mm -hmm. But my first thing would be, I'm doing marriage counseling. If you're having an affair, I can't continue to work with you. So those are, would be a place, unless you're willing to work on that, like we need to talk about that, right? Um, if, it, if the couple, if it was a couple that came in and said, we are free lovers, we just, we're okay with, we're both gonna commit adultery, it's all fine. It's really not my place as a counselor they're hiring to, you know, if they're not Catholic, to, to say you're going, you know, I, I, it's really not my place to say you're going to hell or that's a But sad. that's not what I'm saying. I'm not okay. saying you would say you're going to hell. Right, right. But, <laughs> but, you know, I don't want to rush to that extreme. Right. But, but surely the, if you love this person committing adultery, I, I think I understand what you mean when you say you wouldn't want to impose your morality on them. Um, in part because it's probably not going to work. If you're dealing with somebody who's trying to be vulnerable. They would leave. They wouldn't believe. stay. They're not going to stay with somebody that is certainly coming off in any way as imposing morality. They're just not so going to stay. And yet I find it hard to believe that if I was coming to you and I was committing adultery, that you wouldn't try and talk me out of that. I find that hard to believe. It, but you're coming, but you would be, if it's you, you would be coming to me as a Catholic. Well, suppose I'm not. Suppose okay. I'm not Catholic. I, I'm, but I'm there just, are ways in which I would still try to confront that person i see it just wouldn't be head, head on. on i see it would be more why like why is it that you are yeah, doing this why, what are yeah. you what are you looking for what do you believe about marriage yeah, yeah, yeah. right i would get to what tell me about 
is this you're saying this is okay like first of all i hmm. wouldn't be believing they thought that yeah but i'm not going to start off by arguing with them right but i would say tell me what you believe about marriage and tell me about what um happens to you when you're having an affair how do you feel after the affair why do you feel that way i see so you see like yeah, yeah, yeah. i think we're going to get somewhere um like i'm i can remember okay here's an example i had a client that was um super devout catholic and I thought they were just, um, you know, beautiful person, but they were so pro-choice. And there was a little, and they were so conversational with me sometimes that I actually kind of fell into like arguing a bit. Yeah. <laughs> but just because they were talk, they would talk other topics. They would be like that, and so it wasn't. I didn't really think of it seriously. And then, uh, but I was like, how could you, what about that? And then they were arguing things like, well, when does the soul enter the body? And what about twins and all this kind of, so they were getting into it. And then I, then I stopped for a moment and I remembered something they had said before about having been in all these relationships, you know, before they had kind of come to Christ and all that. And then all of a sudden it hit me like something like the Holy Spirit just hit me. And I looked at the, the, the guy and I said, did one of those girlfriends have an abortion? And it was just like, you could see his face change. And it was like, oh, now I understand. So I changed the conversation completely. If I just came on, continue to argue with him, yeah, yeah, yeah. why he should be pro-life would lose him. It's a great point. And I suppose, and this is oversimplifying things, perhaps, maybe it's not at all, sanctity and sanity <laughs> go hand <laughs> in hand. And so mm. the, 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 the more healing one receives, the less likely they are to be engaging in patterns of sin, right? The fully healed person right. is not a person engaging in sin. So if, as you say, you're working with somebody to heal a particular part of their life or focusing on their anxiety, or then right. presumably what you're going to have is somebody growing in sanctity, and I, or at least virtue. At least virtue. So, so that's why I love the work I do. That's why I love my practice, Transfiguration Counseling, because I typically have the freedom to make that connection mm -hmm. and work with my clients about that connection. And they, they will buy into that and they will agree and we work on it. Um, if a person doesn't buy into that, you're never going to convince somebody though by just explaining that. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, that probably gives you some insight into dealing with like human beings on an un when you're not a therapist, right? It's like, right? It, it, yeah, it's like if you're dealing with a loved one who's engaging in serious sin, it doesn't take you long until you realize it may just be imprudent to bring this up head on because it's not only unproductive, but counterproductive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I gotta focus on loving the person maybe. Yeah. yeah. Not, not, not maybe, <laughs> definitely. Here's another question from a fantastic patron, Dominic D'Alessandri. Can you explain, now we've, we've spoken a little bit about this, okay? So some of these maybe feel free to give a shorter answer. Mm -hmm. Can you explain the relationship between obsessive compulsive disorder and scrupulosity? So you've 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 I would addressed just say this. I don't know if you want to take another. One it's just that a subset. Or... That's the simplest. Okay, answer. so scrupulosity is a subset. A subset. Of... It has particular things about it that make it unique, but it falls in my mind. It falls under that category. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this comes from Rachel Alexander. What are your thoughts on trauma therapies like EMDR? You don't have any experience with EMDR. I'm an EMDR consultant, <laughs> so I can train other EMDR therapists. I love EMDR. I what think is it's it powerful. and why do you love it? It stands for eye movement desensitization reprocessing. So what you're really doing, it's, and to explain it in a nutshell is hard, but I will try. You're, <laughs> you're, um, you're, bringing, you're, you're reminding a person, you're activating a person on the things that were traumatic from the past. So you are targeting a past event, but it has to be something that has current activation in your physical system. You're activating, so you're, you're bringing it up in the physical body, the right side of the brain, I'll make it real simple and call it that, the part that is the, self, the subconscious or emotions, memories are tied up, gets activated through bilateral stimulation, stimulating both sides of the brain to allow healing to happen on that subconscious emotional level in order to then integrate with the left side of the brain that is our ordered logical thinking narrative side mm -hmm. in order to release trauma out of the body and out of the mind. Mm. Powerful stuff. Wow. Okay, uh, let's see here. We get another question from patron Nathan Alex. Is there a legitimate epidemic of anxiety and depression amongst millennials and Gen Z, or is it more of a spiritual crisis stemming from a rejection <laughs> of religion? Oh. Well, I would say both. How about both? Can't they be both true? <laughs> Why not both? Um, I think that we're always on. Like, I can't imagine. Like, I'm old now, but 
I mean, I don't, I remember not having access to things all the time. So I don't know, I can't even imagine what it's like to grow up where you're always connected, texting, you're accessing any TV show you want for as long as you want, being, you know, always social media, you're always on display. And I think there's little time for silence, little time for rest. And I think that takes a toll. I think from a trauma perspective, then we're in a, always in a state of a little bit of fight or flight. We're always a little, you know, that window of tolerance I said before, mm -hmm. we're always on the upper end. We may not be crossing over completely, but we're always on the upper end all the time. And our bodies are not meant to be in that state all the time. And it causes physical ailments as well as emotional elements like anxiety. That's why panic attacks and just, it's a physical reaction, right? It's not just in the brain. Have you ever had a panic attack? Is that too personal a question? I um, should have asked that first one. I yeah. have actually. I mean, what I it, what's, had it, it, what's it like? Because people explain it to me and it almost, it's hard for me to comprehend. Although maybe I was in a car accident and I actually um, saw the car coming and then braked or whatever. And so I had some physical pain. But then it was one of those things like a flashback thing where I'd be like, I'd wake up like and in, in my, I would see the car coming in my head. Yeah. And this was after the event. And um, so, you know, I've actually done EMDR myself for, for that and some other things in my life. So um, I actually think, think it's real. I think it's powerful. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. We've got about four more questions here. So let's see. Noah Anderson says, what are some things a Catholic can do, think about, to help balance the paradox between accepting our flawed, sinful state of nature and our calling to pursue a life of holiness? It's a, it is a, good, it's, it's a really good question. Isn't okay, it? let's then ask it again. I just want to make sure. Oh, I understand okay. It. Let's see here. <laughs> uh, what are some things a Catholic can do to th or think about to help balance the paradox between accepting our flawed, sinful state of nature okay. and our calling to pursue a life of holiness? So, in other words, and just just so uh, I can kind of put my own spin on this. Um, we want to avoid perfectionism. Right. This idea that unless I'm perfect, I'm unlovable or more than that, perhaps. But right. at the same time, we're called to holiness. Right. And so sometimes it seems to me that you encounter a lot of Christians who are just like, hey, I'm broken, but I'm a work in progress. And you're like, okay, but shouldn't you, <laughs> shouldn't you like be done by now? Like, shouldn't, if you were really open to God's grace, wouldn't, wouldn't you cease being as messy as you are? Right. Why are we celebrating mess? Mm. Uh, that sort of thing. Yeah, so that's a great question because that sounds like that inner conflict, right? Where on one hand, there's a part of me that wants to be perfect and get it right and be a saint. And then there's another part of me that struggles. So how do you see, you know, how if, you, if we were to see it that way and visualize these two parts, can the self actually show up, right? The compassionate, calm, whatever part of ourselves, kind, the wisdom, they can actually look at that and say, well, the part of me that wants to be perfect, you know, might need something, right? Like you're saying, you, you, we're, we're in a fallen world, we're not gonna be 100% perfect. It's okay not to be perfect. Mm -hmm. But what does the other side need? You know, like if you're messing up all the time, what do they need? Do they need chastisement? Or do they need to be understood? What's really going on? If you're in habitual sin, what is it that is Oof, fueling that? Question. You know, what is yeah, yeah, yeah. fueling that all the time? What is, I would say, what is the burden there? That is such a great question. I mean, I think about how I relate to my children as well. It's, mm -hmm. That's a good question to ask because the temptation when I'm irritable or when I just don't have time mm -hmm. to emotionally invest in this child is chastisement. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's appropriate, perhaps. Right. Well, indeed. However, I think maybe more often than I'm willing to admit, it's this person, I need to sit with them and say like, what, what's going on? Exactly. I mean, I, I've had times where my children just sort of melt down as everybody's kids melt down at some point. And the temptation like, go to your room. Or go, Why are you doing that? And it's like, actually, that's not at all what they need. What they need is you to just be like, hey, let's go for a walk. Let's, let's get an ice cream. Mm -hmm. Talk to me. Like, what, what's going on? I love you. Right. I miss you. Let's talk. When you do that, you're modeling them to do that for their own <sighs> internal systems. And so the follow-up to that is, yeah. if we can all realize that that's what our children might certainly need, what, how are we treating ourselves? Right. Is it like, you stupid piece of crap? Which it is a lot of the time, as opposed to being more curious about our yeah. fallen brokenness and gentle. Here's the thing. I would say that there's a part, 
you know, sometimes it gets called an interject, if you will, in the ego state world. But there's a part of the self that thinks it's fill in the blank, your dad, maybe it's your critical mom, I don't know. But, or, or maybe it's even the person who bullied you or, or was like abusive to you. Okay. There's, a, there's often, when you do some of this work, there's often a part that thinks it's that person. And when you actually look inside your system and you look at your parts and you actually encounter them with the therapist's help, right? Can you approach that part that maybe that part's just like my dad, my dad who was rigid and, you know, uncompromising and, you know, moralistic and to be able to say, do you know you're not your dad, right? Do you know you're not, maybe that guy's in Australia. I don't know. I'm not talking about your dad, (laughs) but you know, maybe that guy's dead now. Like, but you know, you're not him. You could never be him. And to actually get to why do you think you need to be him? Oh, if I not if I if I'm not strict, moralistic, and shaming, then the whole system's going to fall apart. And that's where the self can come in and say, "We're not going to let that happen." Now look at I've got Christ with me. We've got look at we've got a whole system of the self is beautiful. We're not going to ever let that happen again. And maybe that part goes, "Oh, I'm not that. I don't have to be that anymore." And, and then there's just this whole calming, right? There's a whole calming effect. That part might say, well, what am I now? I've been this critical, critical SOB for a really long time in your system. And, that, and that's a great discovery. You need a new job, <laughs> you know? We, we can't actually be lack. We do need motivation. We do need to be pushed sometimes. You might have a good role, but we don't need it to be shaming and demeaning. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's fantastic. So this is the problem when you start talking, Jerry. I start listening, and then I can't do <laughs> three things at once. Uh, all right, um, I want to I want to bring something up uh, before we get to our next questions, and that is an an excellent app called Hello. Have you heard of Hello? I have indeed. I, I, I this is a selling thing. I mean, they're, they're paying me to to advertise them, so that's what I'm doing right now. To be very clear, but I'm I love that. I love them. I I actually um, had Hello on my app for a while on my phone for a while and then I got a new phone I didn't have it and I just downloaded it about a week ago and I paid for the annual subscription it is amazing Mm -hmm. like really 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 good so I just want to say out there you know if you're somebody who wants to grow in your prayer life if you need more peace in your life if you're struggling with anxiety go download hello hello.com slash Matt Fratt I'll put a link in the description below um, when you sign up at hello.com slash Matt Frad, you'll get a month for free so you can try all of the stuff that they have. And they've got great stuff there. They've got actually, you know, what, I should totally play it. Oh, this is really funny. I don't know if this will come through or not, but I, um, I did a sleep story for them. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's not bad. I'll, I'll show you what it sounds like. You tell me what you think. And then I'm going to contrast that with Jonathan Rumi, not to compare myself. <laughs> the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Let him kiss me with kisses of his mouth. All right. That's a woman saying that, not me. Just to be clear, someone's going to make that a cutaway clip. And why is Matt asking for some dude to kiss him with kisses of the mouth? All right. But now, <laughs> check out Jonathan Rumi. This dude, this is the guy who plays Jesus and the Chosen. Oh, yeah. You can have Jonathan Rumi read you a sleep story. Listen to this. Hi. I'm Jonathan Rumi, the actor who plays Jesus in the new streaming series, The Chosen. Oh, my gosh. So, fantastic app, and I'd recommend people go check it out. Hello.com slash Matt Frad. Hello.com slash Matt Frad. But actually, do you have any opinion on the app? Have you I seen love it? that app. Have yeah, you used it? I have. Hmm. Good. I'm really glad you said that <laughs> since, uh, since they're an advertiser and not like, they suck, because that would have been hard to get out of. No, 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 no. They're really good. Okay, uh, question here from Sam. Thoughts on what to look for as a good fit when looking for a future therapist? Well, um, what's funny is actually in the field, right, and research that's been done in terms of what therapy, what makes therapy effective. And there's two things that make it effective, and it doesn't matter what type of therapy they're using. Because there's like, you may not know it, but there's tons. There's CBT and like I I mentioned EMDR and ego state therapy, all this different stuff. But the two things that matter are hope. Well, they call it positive expectancy, psychological term. It really means hope. Mm. And the other one is 
a working relationship with the therapist, like a connection with the therapist. If you have those two things, like, and the, and the therapist is part of the hope really, because they're usually instilling it, right? They're coming in with, hey, I, I work with this area. Like when someone comes in with anxiety or trauma or past sexual abuse, hey, this is, this is what I do. I work with this all the time. I, you know, I have all kinds of strategies to, to and I can help you. Hmm. Then you know there's hope. And if you, if you, you know, you're, it's okay to meet with somebody once and try out another person and try out another person and just to, to find somebody that you fit with because that working, that safety and connection is really key to success. Mm. So have you ever met a therapist and you think to yourself, I don't think you should be a therapist because <laughs> no one would come to you and feel safe. That's okay. probably, I don't know. Can I share? Okay. I'll share the story. Do it. It's a little bit funny. I was working with Dr. Peter and we were making this course and the, I think I mentioned it, choosing a Catholic therapist. Say, what's his last was name? Dr. Peter Malinowski. Yeah. He's in Indianapolis and uh, he does all kinds of great, he does a really great po uh, uh, podcast better than mine. I think uh, interior therapist and uh, gets into all this stuff. But we were working on this course, we're choosing a therapist, and it's not like I knew everything about it, like I could talk about it in my sleep. But for some reason, I was having a really hard time, like I was blocking. And at one point, so Peter comes to me and he goes, what's wrong, because I can tell something's wrong. And it's like, I've been trying to find my own therapist for like months, and it always, it's never working. Like I'm always, and I'm really trying not to be that guy who is like, I'm a therapist, so I'm going to like, yeah. you know, be like, critical. you better be better than me or something. No, I was just looking for the right fit and I couldn't find it for the longest time. And so I was felt like a fraud. Here I am doing a thing on how to find a therapist when I can't find one. Right. Uh, but I did find one okay. and I found one that was great and worked really well for me. So, and do you mind me asking, uh, uh, well, I want to ask where they live, but the reason I want to ask that is to get your opinion on uh, say Skype counseling and yeah, I have to with this person, I have to do it uh, via video and it works really well. Yeah. Cause that was gonna be my question. I imagine some people are thinking, well, that's not ideal really. And if I'm going to be paying for therapy, I need it to be as effective as possible. No, the person I found was really, really great. And I actually even found another person so it's funny i ended up with two well not i only see one at a time normally but i i actually went both and found at the same time would be pretty cool two windows two <laughs> therapists yeah, really. no but both. I, I wanted this the person i found that is amazing is, does parts work and and that's what i wanted but i actually wanted to process like two things with emdr and i wanted a really really good emdr therapist so i went for the best I don't know if I should say who it is because it's sort of my own private information, but she's one of the best EMDR therapists in the country. So I was able to get her and just to do two sessions, I knew exactly what I wanted to work on. And it was fantastic. And it was even online, which I hadn't been doing. She had this great program that where the dots moved and I was able to follow and track with my eyes. And then it sort of went back to her in just a really cool way. So there's, you can get really effective therapy online nowadays it's just improving all the time that's awesome okay we got a question here from an amazing patron kyle he says for a married catholic in need of therapy for a particular issue to what extent should we involve our spouse in processing our thoughts and walking together versus protecting our spouse from our struggles by speaking to our therapist is there a place for creating an emotional boundary of some kind so our spouse does not inadvertently become our therapist oh Wow, there's a lot in there. There's I think a lot. that's really good. As a marriage and family therapist, I also come at it from a systems point of view. So I believe that, I think there's a very Catholic way of looking at it, that we're all part of the body of Christ. And in a, in a marriage, there's a spiritual union, you know, one flesh. So I really do think when you only see one person in a marriage, you're getting a very limited view. And so even if maybe the, the person's coming in to work on something very particular, like a very particular trauma, I still think it's useful to have the spouse come in at least once, right? And oftentimes you can do something where you alternate, but I actually think it's very, very helpful. Um, when it comes to some things like addiction, some addictions, like especially like sexual ones, I don't believe your spouse should ever be your accountability partner or, for, or at least of all your therapist. And that can be just overwhelming. I still think she needs to be informed if there's a problem right? If, if he's struggling or not, but, mm -hmm. but every little detail and that is, that would just harm her and it's unnecessary. 
Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Does that answer? I don't know. There was a lot in that question. No, I think I think that's good. Let's see that question again here. Um, oh, okay, I can't pull it back up. So let, let's not see that question <laughs> again. But I, I think it's a good point. I I I, am, I agree with you. I I've heard too many people suggest that a man should withhold what he's struggling with f- from his wife. And no. I don't think that's true. Right. I, I, it almost like treats the the wife like a sort of wallflower who's unable of, you know, handling what you're going through. Now, obviously, every couple's different. Every woman's different. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like the, it could be the case that your wife is sick and is in the hospital with cancer or something. I don't know. Right. And and there, there's probably a time and a place. Right. And that time and a place might be disclosure in therapy. Right. But I, I don't think the old advice that people used to get of don't don't tell your spouse, they don't need to know that, just bring it to confessional is, is good advice. Because if you're you struggling think? with something and then it blows up in some way, she's going to eventually find out. And now you've got the added problem that she was kept in the dark for so long and now something's really blown up. So it's just, I think honesty is the best policy, but there's prudence in that, yeah. in exactly yeah. how and what. I actually go through a disclosure pro- process with a guy, like usually a guy, <laughs> and most of the time for me anyway, yeah. is, is um, a whole, like if he has a whole history or something and she doesn't know, I have a whole process, a four-step process that he has to work on and it, it provides safety for her and uh, it, you know, involves like naming it, but also working on how he got to this place, how it damages and hurts the relationship and, and then what his plan is to, to work on that. And, and, it, and I find that when he's done that work and it, I said it really fast, but that actually can take weeks and weeks to work on. Sure. And, 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 and actually then he discloses that it, it has a better chance of, uh, she's not going to necessarily like it and she may have her own feelings. She has every right to all of her feelings, but it may actually help with the understanding. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, question here from Benjamin Height. He says, my wife abandoned the marriage shortly after my conversion to the Catholic church. Do you have any resources or tips for single fathers of small children? Every Catholic book on family life I've encountered is geared towards families with two parents. I don't know how to proceed as a new Catholic and as a new single dad. I'm so sorry, Benjamin, for what you're going through. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't, I'm not thinking of a resource that just comes to mind, unfortunately. So yeah, I feel for him and the extraordinary um, situation that he's in. And then, of course, he's going to feel all kinds of sadness and loneliness i i would say um i would i don't know the whole situation at all so i would have a hundred questions but you know it it seems like there had to be more that she left for than the faith and that if she's leaving the children too i don't know so i don't know the whole story of course so um pray for her uh as opposed to just demonizing her like i'm sure who knows i don't again i don't know if you're demon he may not be demonizing her at all but but just pray for her and uh, and then there are support networks. I think that I think there are more than you probably realize. Maybe even at your church, you know, and even your pastor, like probably at a local level, more than I'm aware of at a national level. But there might be, you know, in terms of your actual parish providing, you know, Stephen Ministries or maybe Meals on Wheels at times, or just having uh, our spiritual direction, or you know, maybe even there's men's groups. Like I know that. It may not be Catholic or whatever, but there are men's groups for stay-at-home dads. And uh, I know you may not be a stay-at-home, he's a single dad, right? But there's, there, I bet there's resources in your community. You mm. just may have to look. Yeah. Um, final question for you. How does one know when one should seek or if one should seek therapy? And just again, as we're wrapping up here, <laughs> what resource would you point them to Right. Uh, you know, just to begin that. Yeah. So I have this perspective that everyone should go to counseling, <laughs> right? That everybody should. Like it just it should be part of your life. Like you go to the doctors, you go to the dentist, you see your counselor. Like you might not need to see them every week or something, but but it should be part of life, right? And how about a mental health checkup once a year at a minimum for everybody? Of course, that's a radical thought, I suppose. But so I, I really do think who couldn't benefit from it, right? Um, from from being able to have a space where someone listens to you and you can talk and share and they help guide and direct. And hey, so, so there's that. Um, but clearly if you're struggling with something, you know, um, 
that maybe qualifies like like a depression right and i guess the question is how do i know if i'm depressed i think if you're asking yourself the question am i depressed or am i uh is, am i experiencing too much anxiety uh am i addicted if you're asking yourself those questions why don't you go get help and find out mm. just if it's occurring to you to ask the question it probably That's means really you could get help point. yeah yeah and again where would they where would they begin to go i mean we've got people of course who are listening in europe and australia and yeah. America, so it's going to be difficult to give a one-size-fits-all resource well we mentioned catholictherapist.com if you're looking for a th- i mean if you're just looking for a therapy you can go to, on a psychology today directory if you're looking mm. for a particular thing like emdr emdria emdr ia.org is a you know would you would have a list if you're looking for a marriage and family therapist there's amft is the organization they have a directory so if you're looking for a particular thing there's usually directories on the websites uh if you if you're fine finance finances is an issue like if you're struggling financially and you have insurance and you, you wouldn't be able to afford it otherwise then you go to your insurance company and they will have people on their panel and mm-hmm. you can look for one I suppose there's probably uh, most priests might be familiar with a oh, therapist yeah. in their area. So. Yeah, I get a lot of my referrals from priests because I'm well connected with many priests in the diocese. And if they know, you know that I'm good or one of the therapists in my group is good, they will send people. So, yeah, that's a great place. Or, or maybe it's a pastoral associate at the church, too, might, might have a list of good references. Mm. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, this has been great. Thanks for taking the time to be on the show. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's been great to see you in Steubenville, Matt. Yeah, we have to go hang out. What are you doing right now? Are you, <laughs> are you free or do you have stuff? I am free for a little bit. You should uh, get a cigar or something. S- sounds great. great. Sounds great. Well, I want to let everybody know that uh, tomorrow we are hosting a debate uh, between a Protestant and a Catholic, both very bright guys on the Magisterium of the Church. We really hope that you can make it and you can watch it live. If you haven't yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, be sure to do that. And that way you won't miss when exciting debates and other things come out like this. Uh, Thank you very much and have a great day.